Hi, everybody. Welcome to our last lecture of the NLIS uh, Colloquium Series. We're delighted this evening to have three panelists with us. Um, our topic, as uh, we had discussed, go ahead, Michelle. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, um, our topic today is uh, dealing with disaster in J libraries after Sandy. Uh, our moderator for this evening is Pat Tumulty. She is the executive director of the New Jersey Library Association. And uh, she will be actually coming up and introducing our other two panelists as well. Um, a couple of announcements. Again, uh, we have a much larger online audience than we do have the audience uh, here on campus, so welcome to all of our online students. It's nice to, to have you back. Again, if you have questions and you're an online student, please go ahead and Michael will uh, send those through the, the chat room in Adobe Connect and Michael will, will read those questions to you. If you have questions in the audience, please make sure that you uh, speak clearly and speakers, if you would uh, repeat the question um, for the online audience, that would be great if the sound can be an issue. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome to our uh, speaker series, um, Pat Tumulty. Thank you, Connie. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you tonight. We're getting our PowerPoint started. As Connie said, I'm Pat Tumulty. I'm the Executive Director of the New Jersey Library Association. Uh, first of all, a shameless plug, I hope you're all members of the New Jersey Library Association, and if you're not, you can go to our website and become joint members of ALA and JLA. It's a great deal, $35, you're a member of both organizations, so I hope you do that, you get the benefits of both of our organizations, so just go to the njla.org and pull down the part that says uh, join now. So we hope that those of you who are not will take advantage of that great offer. Um, as Connie said, I'm going to be moderating this program and I'm going to start with a PowerPoint presentation that we put together for a program that actually one of our speakers organized on Monday. So let me just briefly tell you who else is going to be speaking to you this evening. Um, after my presentation, we're going to have Susan Quinn, who is the director of the Ocean County Library. And if many of you don't know, Ocean County was severely impacted by Hurricane Sandy. And certainly Susan has two branches of her system who are not yet operational since the storm. And she will tell you how much wonderful and really heroic work her staff and the library did during Hurricane Sandy. And then our, sec our, last, uh, our next speaker will be Michelle Stricker, who is the Associate Director of Library Support Services for the New Jersey State Library. On Monday, in fact, Michelle organized a conference called Ports in the Storm, uh, which had over 130 participants. I think this is the first kind of conference of its type which talked about libraries, particularly public libraries, as being responders in a natural disaster. And I think this is a program that we hope becomes a model for the country. It was an excellent program, and we learned many things, and many of the lessons learned we will talk about tonight. So my job tonight is just to sort of give you an overview of what happened in terms of the library community and certainly what happened to New Jersey. So we call this a storm called Sandy, and it really is. October 29th was a day that changed New Jersey forever. So what happened? Many of you, I'm sure, in this room lived through it. It was unprecedented destruction. Uh, 346,000 homes were destroyed. Seven million people were without power. And I gave a, a brief presentation like this at ALA midwinter, and at that time, 41,000 people still did not have power at that time. And then we've shown you some pictures that I got from some of our colleagues. These were pictures taken right after the storm. Uh, someone's asked me to do something with the lights. No, we cannot. I, I do not have the control of the slide. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, we want to show you one of the pictures. This is a house that's actually out in the middle of Barnegat Bay. Um, this shows you the houses that were destroyed. It was just absolutely an incredible, incredible um, natural disaster. We bring this, because this is one of our, our colleagues, if any of you know Peggy Cadigan, she is a uh, she works at the New Jersey State Library. This is Peggy in the middle of her backyard. Uh, with all the pine trees, she lives in Point Pleasant, all the pine trees around her, and there she has her, um, she's cutting them all down with her, um, what do you call that, 
power saw, or whatever we call that chainsaw. It's her chainsaw massacre picture that she's going to be using later, but uh, Peggy was, uh, her community was really devastated. So what did we, NJLA, as a library community do to respond to this um, disaster? One of the first things that we did was we sent out a status check. We tried to check on all of our libraries, tried to collect as much information as we could to find out how many libraries were impacted by the storm. And it was kind of, in a, in a way, very frustrating because, if you may you know, it was Sunday to Monday was the storm. We were called by Library Journal like on Wednesday or Thursday saying, well, can you tell me exactly how many libraries were damaged and what, you know, and we're like, you don't understand. People in this state are reeling. People do not have power. I mean, virtually everybody I know did not have power. I had power in my office, but I didn't have power at home. It was just very hard to get that kind of information. People wanted it so quickly, and it was just impossible to get. And that's where we're going to talk a little bit again about how libraries responded, because communities were really devastated after this storm. And another thing we did, we set up a special Flickr uh, account where we asked libraries to show us pictures immediately what they were doing after the storm. And if any of you may have noticed when you came in, Michelle had the PowerPoint of our Flickr kind of uh, slideshow going of, a, of the libraries who sent us pictures of what they did. And here are some of the things that we saw from our libraries, particularly those libraries who could get open, were open as fast as they could, and you can just see by the crowds they were inundated by the public. Um, we showed every kind of power strip that could be made was made available so people could power up their electronics. I mean, the libraries knew immediately that people needed this kind of place, they needed a self safe shelter, they needed some place where they could get their equipment, you know, use the wireless, use the internet. Some of them needed to reach family members. It was just an overwhelming response. And again, we show people just all over. They were just everywhere in our libraries. They came. They knew this was the community centers. And I, one of the pictures that we had on the slideshow shows people that says, you know, come in, we're open, you know, coffee. People, then we made coffee. People did all kinds of things to make the library. We always think the library is a welcoming place. But believe me, after Hurricane Sandy, our libraries went above and beyond to make it the community space. We had one of our communities, at least two of the communities I heard of, the mayors would come over to the library because they knew that's where all the people would be. And so we walked around the library meeting with people, kind of updating them on what's going on in their communities because there was no way to, else to get the information out. So it was really an amazing response as a community center. What else did we do? We immediately, because people were so wanting to help, we immediately started a fund calling um, we build a New Jersey library fund, and I understand I'm going to get another donation tonight, and I'm really very pleased about that. Um, to date, we have raised over $10,000 for that fund. And we've got, we've got donations from all over the country, but this is one of the most touching donations. We didn't necessarily come directly to our fund, but I got a phone call um, at my office, and the woman said, I'm the director of the Joplin, Missouri Public Library. And if you don't remember, Joplin was devastated by a tornado about 18 months ago, she said to me. And she said, you know, people were so good to us, we want to pay it forward. So can you identify for me a staff person in a library in New Jersey who has lost everything that we can help? And uh, we were fortunately able to Long uh, Branch Public Library, Ingrid Gruff, she's on our board, we talked about this and she identified one of her library clerks who was a single mother who lost absolutely everything. And she kept coming to work. She had no place to go, but she came to work to save others. So we were able to give the $1,000 directly from the Joplin, Missouri Public Library to Kadisha. And it was just I really one of the most heartwarming things that we got to do. It was just such a connection of library people together. And again, when we look at the donations that we got, people all over the country really responded. We got them from, I think, like 24 different states, from Canada, from Scotland. People just sent us in donations, and we were just so grateful. We sent the Hopewell Public Library is a small library in Mercer County sent out from their friends who said, don't give us Christmas donations, donate to this fund. And again, it was just so heartwarming. So what we're going to talk about now is some of the libraries in the hurricane region. And we use one of our libraries as a real prime example 
of getting involved, being involved, unfortunately, because you had to be right in the ground. This is the Neptune Public Library. The Neptune Public Library is in Monmouth County, uh, and as they prepared for the storm, they've been pretty well connected to their community. And the mayor actually said to the library, he said to all municipal employees, pack your bags, for 72 hours you are going to be working. And the staff of the library was expected to work. And they did all kinds of things, filling out FEMA sheets, um, documenting where people were closed. I mean, the, I'm going to show you a few more pictures. Um, this is the tent. They were sent up a tent in one of the more devastated areas. They took all their laptops, they got a wireless connection there and set up six, six wireless laptops and their staff helped people fill out forms, helped the, the responders on the ground. They were just indispensable in terms of really being involved right during the storm. They were part of the emergency management um, operation system all through Hurricane Sandy. And again, these are pictures of them in the FEMA tent. They were partnering with other community agencies like the Public Works Department, you know, doing all kinds of things that they could to help people. Many people, as you may know, you know were elderly, particularly, who had no familiarity of even how to fill out an online form. They needed help immediately, and the expertise of the library community was indispensable. And so once they were reopened, they came and they said, that we put out email blast to the township. We put out extension cords, extra power plugs. They, you know, did the kinds of things librarians sometimes we never do, but like suspended overdue fines and tell everybody it's fine. Just, you know, whatever you can do, whenever you can do it, because they realized how hurting many people were in their communities. And that's the other thing I think I want to mention. Some of our other libraries, some of the messages I got from our library directors were: we just said to our staff, be as patient as you can possibly be. People have gone through such a trauma that they need us to be as understanding as we can be. And I think, again, it was that sense of normalcy that our libraries brought to those communities, which was so important. And we, um, they sent out other things. This is, again, from Neptune. Why we put it so many of these slides was to show you the ongoing sort of commitment that the library made. This was not a one-day event. Responding to Hurricane Sandy has taken weeks, but the library was engaged from the beginning and engaged with their public throughout, letting them know we're open, letting them know what services that they have. Now, we asked kind of the, Marion Bauman is the name of the director at the Neptune Public Library, and we asked Marion how did she get sort of this close connection with, with her municipality that it worked so seamlessly during this crisis, and Marion, really told us some lessons that I think are lessons that we need to learn. She told us that they had built up over several years a really strong relationship with their community. They participate in the mayor's book club. They, you know, they, they do things like participate in National Night Out, which is a, a crime prevention night. They do things for first night. They do things for email blasts. They attend retirement parties of other people in the township. Bring all these things up is they make the library an integral part of the community, not a silo. Too often we hear, oh, well, there's the library. It's like someplace over here. No. The work that those people do in Neptune shows you that the library is integral to their, their community. Now we're going to start talking about some of our other libraries that were in the hurricane soon. This is Susan's Library, the Ocean County Library. And we bring this up because almost immediately when they could, they put out on their website hurricane resources. They were able to gather that kind of information because, again, that's what we do as librarians, gather that information. And as soon as they could, they put out on their website as much information as they could for the public on hurricane disaster. But unfortunately, Ocean County did suffer some, some grave disasters. And I'm just going to just gonna show you a couple pictures. Um, these are the Bayhead branch and the Lavalette branch of the Ocean County Library, both of these branches. Um, we're pretty devastated. Um, Susan can tell you more about them. They're still not open. Um, so you can see that they were just down to the studs. Everything, trying to dry out the building, everything that they could possibly do. These two buildings were pretty much devastated. Ocean County, though, again, and Susan, I think we'll talk a little bit more about this, became a real active partner with FEMA. 
And as you can tell, they're telling the people, FEMA is here, we can help you with FEMA forms. I think this is, again, it's been the past several years, but certainly here in New Jersey, there's no paper. Everything's online. People who didn't know how to use computers, didn't know how to interact on the internet, were certainly struggling. And if they had to fill out insurance forms, and FEMA forms, and government forms, if they didn't know how to do it, the library was indispensable in doing that. And again, what you see at Ocean County is a real sense of, we know what to do. Publicizing it right there. We got FEMA. We know how to help you. Again, telling them that the FEMA, we have extra outlets. We can do everything on your plugs, everything. <clears throat> and this is one of the pictures they sent over to me, which I think is really proud. This poor guy, he still has his Ocean County Library card. It sort of went through the storm. You can't really see the picture too well. It's a little battered and whatever, but he proudly still had it. I'm not sure how many of his other possessions he had, but he still had his Ocean County Library card, and he wanted to show people that he still it made it through the storm. Again, one of our other hard hit areas was Monmouth County. And again, these are things from the Monmouth County Library. They lost uh, one of their branches and two association libraries, which are smaller libraries in Monmouth County, Monmouth Beach and Seabright were both, are both still not open. Uh, Oceanport, which I believe is the branch of the Monmouth County Library, is still not open. So we still have some libraries that are really still struggling after the storm. Now, one of the things that we hope to learn and we want to do in the work that I know Michelle is starting to do at the State Library is that we're showing you things about how libraries are responding in natural disasters. But libraries can also be called upon to respond in a whole variety of unfortunate community disasters. This is a picture from the Gloucester County Library. And they had this fall, uh, I think it was in February, in Paulsboro, which is a very small town in Gloucester County, they had a chemical spill where a train derailed. It was a chemical spill. The whole town was locked down. They locked the kids in the school. But people were desperate for information. It was, it was a natural disaster. And the Gloucester County Library responded immediately by putting up as many resources as they could so the public would know what kind of chemical they were dealing with, what kind of impact that could have on their community, if they heard anything from municipal officials. So again, we're taking this new role of libraries as being those who are there. We know we're not first responders, but we're definitely second responders. And we're people, we are the place where people are going to go to look for information. So whether it be a natural disaster, or unfortunately, as in Paulsboro case, a man-made disaster, libraries need to have this be able to respond to their public. And we're going to talk a little bit about this tonight, and this is again what the um, focus of the workshop was on Monday, kind of lessons learned. What did we learn as we now, four or five months later, get to reflect about what happened about Hurricane Sandy and its impact on New Jersey? I think we learned that we were not as prepared as we'd like to be. Few libraries really had a formalized written disaster plan. And I don't, I mean, even how to communicate with their staff, knowing whether their staff was going to be this. It, it's devastating to say, as we talked at dinner about a snowstorm that Susan has had to close her libraries for. This was where you didn't even know if your staff had any way to communicate to you, because many of their homes were destroyed. So it's, we didn't have plans like that. How do we respond? And how do we connect with the other community partners that we need to? Why weren't we all at the table, like the Neptune Public Library? They said Neptune was right there, right before the storm, their community, their mayor pulled them in and told them that they were going to play a really integral part in the storm. So how can we be more skilled for the next time? What can we, as the library community, do for the next time to improve our response? These are, this is, you know, we all learn now, it's not if another disaster is going to happen, it's when another kind of disaster. And it may not be statewide, but it may only be in your own community as it was in Paulsburg. But you may be faced with that. And how do we interact with our community? What role, and this is another interesting thing that we had never learned before, but what role did social media play? How is social media used in this disaster? How can we better connect with social media to talk about our story? And we also learned from other people that good old-fashioned paper 
was important to many people. If people were in a shelter, they may not have had wireless, they may not have had anything like that. They needed paper. They needed to know where the next soup kitchen was, what else to do. All kinds of communication forms were called into play during Hurricane Sandy. And how do we use all of those effectively? One of the things we learned afterwards was there was a great um, website called Jersey Shore Hurricane News where people were posting things. How do we find out to make sure that we get the library information on that? NJLA had a website and if we knew libraries were starting to be open, we'd put a list up, we'd say where it is. But how do we interact where a lot of people were coming? This was sort of became a central point for a lot of people in Ocean County. So how do we get our messages onto these places? This is just some of the, um, you know, people were asking, where can we find ice? Where can we find food? Where can we do this? They were just the basic things that they needed to know, and how can we gather that information? And again, if you were through Hurricane Sandy, it was cold if your house didn't have heat. And again, this is Peggy Cadigan sharing her dog, who was a, uh, <laughs> taking care of her niece. And what she liked to show about that, she posted that on Hurricane Sandy News and got over 2,000 likes the first day. The message of that is people were going there. We could track how much people were using that thing. So even this brought a lot of smiles to people's faces. So she was very pleased to have done that. So future steps. And again, we as a library community have many things we need to learn from Sandy. And one of those is how do we form these community partnerships? How do we not act as a silo, but figure out who else is working on disaster where can we play most effectively? How can we share our information? Work with libraries who have a disaster plan. And it doesn't have to be a 50-page document that's, you know, never you can do it once and then you never look at it again. It has to be a living document that a staff can review at least once a year. Something that's quick, practical steps that they can use to make sure everyone knows what to do. Staff training, again, that will be a key component in terms of making sure the staff knows how to respond. We're also talking about how we as a state can better do that, meaning how the statewide coordination, how can NJLA, how can the state library <coughs> figure out how we get our state partners to see libraries as an integral part of the plan. We're looking certainly for future funding opportunities. Many of our libraries reported that their wireless capacity was just strained, you know, tremendously during this, that, that they lost their wireless capacity. They realized how many people were coming in with their devices, and the wireless capacity that we have in our libraries right now was just inadequate to make response. So we'd be looking to get generators for our libraries, not for every library, but maybe for a certain number of libraries, maybe generator support, so we can be open right after the storm, the growing the storm. And then, well, we wanted to show at the end, there's a beautiful, this sunrise, you can't see that, so it's a rainbow over New Jersey. We're gonna get through this, you know, because remember, we're Jersey strong. That's what we like to say. So I'm going to now turn the phrase that we're gonna have questions at the end when we moderate. I'm now gonna turn the uh, program over to Susan Quinn, who is the director of the Ocean County Library. wanted to say that the, your first thought um, when the disaster strikes, when the storm passes, and this one said, oh, see you on the other side. Because we really didn't think that we had experienced Hurricane Irene and we'd be prepared for it, but, you know, we thought, okay, we'll, we'll see you tomorrow. And the first thing you think of is, are all your people accounted for? Can you, are all your staff accounted for? And that is number one, to make sure everybody is. And um, when we had two staff members who were not accounted for, our HR department went out and made sure that they were accounted for. And once, once that is taken care of, then you start thinking about your buildings and facilities. And, you know, you wake up and you wonder, how many buildings? We have 21 facilities in Ocean County Library. And you wonder, how many of our buildings are, are left, are expanding and or can open? So you begin that process of evaluating your buildings and uh, checking up, and it comes up, and then you're dealing with power issues and power outages. And one of the things that when you have a really great team of great employees, which we do have at the Ocean County Library management team and our staff, is when you don't have power, you've got to rely on the good judgment and knowledge of your people to act independently and to do what they need to do. Pat was talking about training. 
Um, it is something we have at Ocean County Library. We're trained. We have something called an emergency room. We train all of our branch managers and staff on that. Um, we had a lot of severe weather, several snowstorms, the hottest summer on record. We had an earthquake. We had a tornado touch down near the Barnegat Branch. And all these things, which I never liked at the time they were happening, teach you. We learned how to bring the system up, how to bring it down, how to bring the system up, how to bring it down, how to open it for the public. So it was practice. Hurricane Irene happened. We had been busy all summer long with a major renovation project for our brick branch at the Ocean County Library. So it had been closed, our staff had been redeployed, and we had a grand reopening celebration on October 27th. And it was really wonderful. We had just created new community spaces that the building never had. We were supposed to have had an expansion and 20,000 square feet from the economy took a turn. We were not able to do that. So, but we did create community spaces within the existing footprint of the building, including installing a new technological infrastructure, more community meeting rooms, a computer lab, a slash conference room. And in the middle of the celebration, I'm speaking with our library commission chairman who is giving me a weather report. And he is very, um, you know, he's excellent and he, he was saying, okay, this is what we're doing. And meanwhile, we're celebrating, and meanwhile, we're getting the library system prepared for a hurricane that we hear is going to take a hook into the Jersey coast. So, uh, you know, there were multiple ways we needed to communicate with each other because when the power fails, you know, you have different cell phones. I had two different kinds of cell phones, but sometimes the only thing that worked was text. And I had a friend of mine from out of state who when I lost power said, who had visited the shore during the summer, who said, Susan, I, I, I'm watching on the news, or hearing on the news, that a house floated into the Mantelopian Bridge in Barnegat Bay. And I texted her back and said, what do you mean a house floated into the bridge? Because I knew that our bay had reading center was really not that far. So I know some of the questions were, you know, what, are, what was your biggest surprise was thinking that Bay had reading center and, um, you know, it's gone and maybe up the shores and then realizing they were okay. And one of the things when we talk about library, librarians and library staff as information professionals is we kept saying to each other, there's a lot of information going on out there. There's a lot of power issues. Paper is very important as a redundant system. Is we were saying to each other, source your information. What's your source? Source your information. Because you couldn't just be like Joe Smith said this. I mean, who was your source? And many of our relationships that we had with our county, because uh, we're part of the uh, larger county system, is we developed relationships both with our county partners and also with our community way before it. It's very similar to what Pat was just writing about with the Neptune weather, although ours was you know, on a different scale, but it was the same process that you can that you can get. We had those relationships. You know, people knew who who you were. And finding out ways that you could help, ways to have power. We are librarians to books to shelter. One of the things that happened in Ocean County is a presidential election and a lot of the polling places were moved and the county clerk's office uh, in the county was trying to let people know where they could vote. And when they opened up electronic voting, that's something that we could do. We were supposed to have been closed on election day, but we stayed open to help our people who needed more. They needed to communicate with their families. People needed a place to go. And also for those residents um, or even first responders who may have needed to vote electronically, went back to the computer, we were able to do that. One of the, uh, you know, one of the biggest things that we did, and again, it's our staff. You, you can't do what we did if you don't have great staff, and if you don't have the support and are sufficiently funded to have the tools that you need during a crisis. We had just installed in 2010 a gas power generator. It was enough to uh, to power our data center, which meant our wireless was up, our phones were up. Uh, and computers were up. And we could tell which branches had power and which ones didn't. And that helped us get the buildings up. Once we get the buildings up, we could get our staff back in to provide services. And you know, even if a building, for example, our Long Beach Island branch, which the very early was a bad way, we didn't was closed, we were getting signals that there was still power up for the LDI branch. So I could call to the county and say, I know you have emergency vehicles 
on that island, we're getting signals that our wireless is still working. So if you get your trucks close enough to the building and you have devices, you may be able to hook into our wireless system to access the internet. Um, as Pat said, shelters, you know, folks more of the newspapers. But one of the things that we did the most was our, we had a very strong relationship with FEMA. They came to our library branches. We welcomed them. They were from different, many of them are from different states. And yes, like some of them are from the Midwest, so they don't really know the short, you know. I mean, especially, here's what exit are you? You know, it's like, here's Tom's River, Seaside Heights, 83, and 62, you're down the back of the 63. And so we were helping them, and what they, what we did, and we had some relationships with the, then, and so what they were able to do is say, hey, we have a new FEMA form. We would say, you know, but it's on this flash drive, I would say, give it to us, we can upload it to our website, which Pat showed you before. We can do this, we have a photo cover, we can do this. Yes, we can, and we told our staff, find ways to say yes, see, see what we can do. And our staff also suffered, just like many residents in Ocean County, our staff suffered some of the same, they lost their houses, you know, they, or in very similar circumstances where they didn't have power. And it's, you know, it's a challenge. But as, as Pat said, it's not when disaster strikes, it's, 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 it's not if, it's when. You know, earlier, prior to the hurricane, there was, a H, there was the H1N1 uh, flu potential outbreak. We work closely with the health department on that because that also causes great great fear. So almost in every different type of disaster, you could, you know, you can apply the lessons learned. I would say, because I'm a Rutgers graduate, so I will say that every class I took here at Rutgers at the School of Communication and Information, I used on the job and I used during this disaster, you know, taking Dr. McNamara's class in knowledge management. You use that. If you want to talk about knowledge management, well, that's something that you're going to apply when you're working with FEMA. You have different people coming in and out, and how do you get the right information out? How do you get something up on the, you know, the website for the public? Or, um, you know, working with Dr. Dr. Mark Winston, who's up there at the Dana Library. We, we did a paper together. I was a student, and I did a, a research paper that took over a year. It was an independent study. I was working at Ocean County Library and finishing this paper with him, and it was. Library leadership during periods of crisis and change. And some of the things we talked about were crises such as war and terrorism, natural disasters, health and medical crisis, and uh, technological shifts and economic change, of which every single thing I think has always happened. So I would say to the students, what you are learning now, you are never going to know what you are learning in this master's degree program that you will use on the job. And it's very interesting for me to have a theory and then to be in a situation where you're practice. And you have to make decisions with the best information you have at the time. And sometimes you're getting information from other sources. It's either state library or it could be NJLA because sometimes, you know, they're communicating with you. They have more information. They have, you know, they have greater contact with the outside world during a, a disaster, so they were very helpful. But it's, it takes a lot of practice. You want to you, you want to help. I, I, I do a personal story. Is I remember being in our Tom's River branch, and you would see people walk into the Tom's River branch, and they, they could potentially have lost their home. And there's the library. Right? It was okay. The Tom's River branch was not one of the branches that opened first. Our Lakewood and our Barnegat branches were the first. Uh, Tom's River did not get power. Tom's River and Brick came up on November. Yeah. So and those are two of our larger branches. And people would come in, and you could tell that it gave them a sense of comfort, but it was also, you could see the look on their face that, wow, you know, here's a sense of normalcy. And that is also what we supply, along with information. I think everything Pat said about information at our libraries is, 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 is absolutely just on point. Uh, everything she said about being part of your Office of Emergency Management is we work with Ocean County. We work with all of our county partners who are there. But one of the stories, I stopped off at our Lacey branch right after this one, and one of the things they said is, our, our staff there said, yeah, we're directing people to know where a soup kitchen is. There's a church nearby that, that has their soup kitchen operational. And they had a, a, you know, a library patron came in to charge their wheelchair because they had no power, and they had no place to charge their wheelchair, so they came into our branch to charge their wheelchair. 
um, you know, it's 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 there's there's so much that you can do. Our, and I'm going to go back to our brick branch, which we just <coughs> renovated. We just created these new community spaces and. Mantelope, which was one of the hardest hit towns in Ocean County, they lost almost half of their houses. That's where the ocean met the bay and cut a channel across Route 35. Um, the town of Mantelope was holding their public meetings in the newly renovated Brick Branch meeting room. You know, people were coming there using the, the new technologies, the new you know, furnishings that we had just put in there, our, our librarians asking for help. Somebody, it would come to the reference desk saying, I'm not from Brick, but can you help me know where the bus line is? And our librarians were helping them with the information about just some of the basic things. Some people said, you know, I just need a place to get warm. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we stayed open on election day when we were supposed to be closed, because it's cold in the winter, and you need, people need a place to, to go. Um, we really had a strong relationship our planning department. We had state and federal agencies, our public services department, led by Valerie Bell, who's fabulous at the Navy of Valerie. She and her team formed a, a hurricane resources um, expo. And what we did was we brought local, state, county, federal agencies together to provide accurate information. Because when you're in a situation like this, having accurate information is critical, it's crucial. I have a master's degree in library and information science. You know, I'm a specialist. And it's challenging. So how about your average person who is dealing with federal forms, state forms, finding information? Right now in Ocean County, we're dealing with the uh, advisory base elevation flood maps, you know, and finding information. So we're directing people on where to find information. And that is really important, where to, to direct people to find information. And when the first responders come in, helping them, but when they leave, and as this goes on, we know in Ocean County this is going to be a longer process. We are going to be here, the Ocean County will be studying. You, you really, I can't emphasize that enough, what you will learn in this program, you will use in more ways than you can even possibly imagine in the future. I think it's hard to follow Pat because she did such a great job that, that I, I can only say that I think that we have done very much what she has suggested on a different scale, it's on a county scale. And it's very important to make people, to let people know that what you can do, say we can do it, this is what we can do. And you know, providing spaces for your community-based organizations, your faith-based organizations, for the meeting of the space that you have. Is, is crucial. Um, as I said, our facilities are used by Mantelope and Seaside Park, Seaside Heights for their public meeting. How, what is more essential than helping government services go on and continue than providing a space for towns who have their municipal buildings either destroyed or um, you know ruined until they can fix to have them come to the library? We, what do, I love this. This is what one of our librarians told um, told Tina, you know, she was um, she was driving again. This was in Brick and saw Tina had a trailer set up in a parking lot in I think it was the municipal complex, and they were standing outside in the cold. And the Brick branch was right across the street, and she said, "We've got to let Tina know because everybody in Ocean County knows where the Ocean County Library is. They don't have to wait in the cold. If they come into our branch, they can at least read a book. They can." use a computer, uh, they don't have to be in the cold. So we really worked hard to let FEMA know what we could do. We invited them in. You know, please come meet with us. How can we help you? We, we tried to, they, they told us we made them feel welcome and that we were part, that they were part of the team. So FEMA was there to help our residents. And the best we could do was also help uh, FEMA and other agencies, state police, help our residents. So there, there's just so many ways. I, I can't even begin to tell the story. But sometimes it goes down to the most personal level, such as, you know, I need to, I need to charge my wheelchair. Or as Pat said, I still have my library card. You know, or don't worry about that book. Don't worry about your fines. Wait, it's fine. It's okay. You'd be surprised at how many people will go out to try to return a library book. It's okay. 
And I think it's just having that friendly face. We are friendly, we're welcoming. Everybody is welcome at the library. And it's a place that they feel comfortable. And it's challenging for you also when you're going to be on the front lines, especially in a public library, because you are going to be, people want to share their stories. So you are hearing those stories as well, and it has an impact on, on you both. What I would say is that I had one of our branch managers said, I think this is our finest hour, and I couldn't agree more. Again, that's a really hard act to follow, but I would say that libraries are essential, and I would say everything you're learning is valuable and important in whatever type of library you choose to work at, including a public library. And it's important work. We are essential. Um, you know, I have, there's, there's so many stories. It, it's really, it's really, it's really hard. The one that, you know, that's, I don't know. I'd like to thank you all for your support. And uh, if you have any questions at the end, we be happy to share them. I think you can see why uh, Susan has been such a leader in this struggle in terms of getting her library noticed and, and, and the work that the whole Ocean County Library has done has really, I think, made us as a library community so proud. And thank you, Susan. I really amazing. For the rest of us to sort of gather the information, that's one thing, but to live it and to breathe it and to make it happen is is, is a whole different level than I can even imagine. So thank you, Susan. Um, our final speaker tonight is going to be Michelle Stricker. Uh, as I said, Michelle uh, from the New Jersey State Library organized a phenomenal workshop on Monday for the library community about, we called it Ports in the Storm. But I think she's going to focus on some of the now um, national models, some kind of resources that we can learn, that we can all use to take us to the next level in disaster planning. So, Michelle. stories uh, tonight and um, it's very hard to follow that but uh, during Sandy when NJLA and Pat they were collecting uh, stories they were collecting photos and you can still go to the NJLA site and you can look through that Flickr account and you'll just see the most amazing photos you don't need words you don't need captions you just need to look at those photos to see the importance uh, of, of the libraries during Hurricane Sandy um, what the State Library did was we actually uh, kept a spreadsheet on every library in New Jersey. And we were interested in finding out who was open, who was closed, if you were closed, what happened? Did you sustain any damage? Was your power out? If you were open, were you serving as what we call um, a disaster recovery center? Uh, were you busier? We were just trying to take down some statistics. And uh, we called every library in the state. Um, if they were closed, we tried the next day. We had all of our staff working on it. So it took, probably took us a good two weeks or so after uh, Sandy was over, maybe a little bit longer, to finally get through that list of 300 and some libraries, not including the branches, to find out what was going on. And we have had uh, phone calls from people from all over the country, Library Journal, uh, interested in that data that we collected. So we've got the data, Pat's got the stories and the photographs. And I think between the two of us, we had a really good picture of how libraries really stepped up and into the role of uh, partners in community response and serving as a community, um, as, serving as a community disaster recovery center. So what had happened was, um, we had all this phenomenal response after Sandy. We could see, I mean, we knew that libraries had assumed these roles in the past, 
I mean, I talked to librarians. I said, yeah, you know, I put out the power strips back in 1991 when we had that Nor'easter. So, you know, in different smatterings, we would hear that libraries just, you know, they stepped into these roles like it was no big deal. They, they were creative. They were flexible. They were able to do these things. Uh, we knew that it happened a little more in Irene. We became a little more aware of libraries assuming this, this role. And then, wow, when Sandy hit and we saw those pictures, we said, something really happened here. All of a sudden, people were taking notice. And not only our libraries were we able to see who, who was uh, stepping into the role as a disaster recovery center for their, for their community, but now the mayors and municipal officials were taking notice. Now the uh, emergency management people are taking notice, okay? Even the people noticed it, and they wrote letters to the editor for their local newspapers. There were several of them saying, thank God for my local library. I don't know where I would have been. So, you know, all of a sudden we noticed this sort of attention and a, a new focus shifting over the libraries that are assuming this role. Um, I have been interested in this for several years now because uh, Massachusetts, was the first that was trying to work right alongside of FEMA. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, disaster recovery, official disaster recovery centers in a minute. I'm already sort of off topic with my PowerPoint. But um, when we, the libraries in the state wanted to talk about Sandy. And when we had our annual library link NJ, which is our library, statewide library network uh, annual meeting, um, Libraries came and they talked about what had happened, and that's when our new state librarian, Mary Chute, uh, she started, um, I guess, the end of end of July, and then you know, wow, uh, Sandy came in. But after that annual meeting, we realized that she realized that you know, I think that we need to do some more work on this. And we had a conference uh, planned, another conference planned for August 10th, and we had booked the venue, but our state librarian had decided, you know, I'm just going to uh, put that conference and postpone it for a little bit because I want to do a disaster planning and recovery conference in that spot, and that sort of uh, when I stepped in, and we worked with, uh, actually our partners were our, um, Library Link NJ, NJ, NJLA, and the New Jersey State Library. And so we were plugging along, planning this conference, when all of a sudden, out of the blue, I got an email from the National Network Libraries of Medicine, Middle Atlantic Region. And so um, they said, oh, Michelle, would you come and talk uh, to our, on our conference, at our conference on disaster planning to public librarians? We're having it April 4th. And I'm like, April 4th? April 10th, and it was like, oh no, and both of us were planning, you know, the same conference basically a few days apart. Actually, I'm sorry, it was, it was April 8th, it was just this past Monday, today is the 10th, so. Um, so we were both planning the same kind of conferences. I was going to ask the National Network Libraries of Medicine to speak, because if you haven't explored their website, if there is some organization that knows all about disaster planning, and recovery, it's National Network Libraries of Medicine. These people have to be prepared. These are your medical librarians. These are the people that step in, make sure your hospitals are ready with the pandemic hits. And they have a phenomenal toolkit on a very, very extensive website. And I had heard about them, but it was not too important to get on this conference that I really uh, realized how wonderful they were. So I urge you to go. You'll probably see some references uh, in my PowerPoint um, uh, to their website. So it was just lucky that we were both sort of planning the same thing at the same time, only they were going to bring in New York. And we decided to join forces together and do a conference together. And I think that both the library world in New Jersey and National Network Libraries of Medicine, I think we both benefited from the partnership because we really, we never partnered before. And it was a phenomenal conference. We had, like Pat said, about 130 people come. Uh, as far as National Network Libraries of Medicine, uh, we had Dan Wilson, who was their coordinator. He speaks nationally. He was thrilled because he had never, in six years of doing this, he had never had a crowd of this large show. So he was, he was happy. And of course, our librarians learned about a whole new organization out there that was really even far more prepared than our libraries were and had an awful lot of resources. So I think, I think we, we, we had, um, it was a great partnership we're going to be working together in the future. So the goal of the conference 
we really wanted to help libraries become better partners in the community in uh, disaster response and recovery. And then we wanted to offer tools to help public libraries pre prepare for a disaster. And uh, and some of these things I'm going to be saying is you know repeating uh, what Pat said and what Susan said. But uh, the Red Cross and the emergency workers at the conference told us that the number one emergency call from Sandy was from people who needed to plug things in in order to stay alive. Ventilators, people had sleep apnea, oxygen machines, uh, you know, you mentioned a wheelchair. That was the number one emergency call to help keep people alive. So, the conference, the whole point of the conference is we want to encourage libraries and challenge libraries to assume the role as a disaster recovery center. And I said here, a public library, any public library that does not embrace its role as a disaster recovery center in the event of emergency represents a lost opportunity to provide an essential service to that community. So what is an official disaster recovery center? We have Lakeville on the right in Massachusetts. They were an official disaster recovery center. But Caldwell on the right, or my right, uh, Caldwell was not. They were uh, an unofficial disaster recovery center. If you are an official disaster recovery center, um, you are pre-certified, pre-qualified by FEMA. And FEMA says that an official center is an officially is a readily accessible facility or mobile office where applicants can go for information about FEMA and other disaster assistance programs like the Small Business Association. Uh, the official centers are staffed by FEMA. I said they're pre-qualified ahead of time by FEMA. Most often they'll have generators so everything is up and running. They're often located uh, in schools, malls, municipal um, uh, complexes, senior centers, and they're even maybe even in, in car dealerships, someplace big where they can fit a lot of people. Now, not every library can serve as an official Disaster Recovery Center, or, or DRC, if I, if I say DCR, I'm sorry, I, I do that a lot. But um, they're expensive to set up, and FEMA needs to staff them, they're expensive to staff. Um, and FEMA simply does not have the resources to set up an official center in every single library, although I'm sure every library would love to get that center. The point we like to make is that libraries have really served all along as unofficial disaster recovery centers. Librarians have worked alongside a FEMA personnel uh, after a disaster, supporting their services and providing assistance uh, to the community. After Sandy, Katrina, Rita, and, and you name it, most of the disasters are going to be weather related. Most of them are hurricanes, but I think Pat brought up you have to think of other kinds of disasters that help it, that happen in your community, like the train wreck that she showed in Gloucester County. What we took away from all of the stories that we heard was that libraries serve as second responders. We're not the first responders, we're not the police, we're not the firefighters, we're not going to pull a Cory Booker and run in burning buildings and pull out, you know, who's ever inside. Uh, that would only get the uh, first responders really ticked off, and we don't want to do that. But the objective of the second responder is that it quickly enables people, you know, in the role that we assume, we're quickly going to enable people to get back to work, to get back to their lives, you know, to ensure continued recovery of, of the community's economic, economic life. So identifying and empowering second responders like the library helps make the difference between you know, a long-lasting disruption in the community and a quick return or a quicker return to daily life. And libraries really play a critical role in making this happen in the community. So uh, some have said that you know, if you're the first to show up, you are a first responder. And yes, that can be true for the first ones there. But generally, that is the role that we're going to assume. Sandy was a reminder for city, county, state officials who sometimes forget the roles that libraries play in disaster response. We have been proven assets in uh, disaster response because you know, we're located in every community, and I read a statistic that said there's more libraries than there are McDonald's in this country. Our, loca our locations are known. Our services are trusted by everyone, even non-users. And the library really serves as a rallying point uh, for the community in an emergency. 
Uh, at the conference, we heard that the American Red Cross said that the number one need uh, after a disaster is information. Well, you know, there are more library workers in New Jersey towns than there are public health workers. And uh, we were told that by the American Red Cross at the conference. And the point they were trying to make is if you, you know, if people think that there's going to be some cavalry riding in to help them out. There's not. There's only a few of these uh, workers who can help. So, you know, if the number one need is for information, then that's where librarians can help like no one else can. Librarians are also viewed as, uh, by the public as knowledgeable, trustful, helpful, approachable, all the things that Susan said, uh, with service with a smile, or customer oriented. And you know, it's funny because we're kind of government workers in a way, from working in a, in a county or municipal library. But you know, we're viewed by the public as more approachable and even more trusted than some of the government agency staff that are, that are sent out. So it's going to be a lot easier for people to come and get their information from a librarian. So if you're not a librarian, you just happen to work in the library and you're the library staff, even that's a benefit to the community because the general staff, the power professionals, they're dedicated, they're trained, they live in the community or they're very familiar with the community and that's a big plus too. Librarians are seen as being able to deliver accurate information in a variety of formats. They're good, we're good, at creative thinking, strategizing, and problem solving. And I think we heard that from Susan in all the ways that her library was able to step up and think quickly on their feet. And librarians can also help aid with coordination with citizens groups and uh, with government agencies. So after a disaster, you've heard this term already, the library is a safe haven. Uh, it's a respite from the storm. These are things that libraries in all the towns uh, had in common. Uh, it was a welcoming refuge for displaced citizens. And there are many reasons for this. Li libraries, some, libraries sometimes have you know, the only safe and secure buildings around. Uh, they're relaxing, they're comfortable, there's seating, there's flexible spaces. Susan alluded to this. Um, uh, more and more, we are building our libraries where you know we can transition transition spaces as we need it. They're heated or they're air conditioned. Uh, they have restrooms, um, and they restore a sense of normalcy. You've heard that ter term already. A, a routine for adults and for children alike. And this all this chaos that's happening in our lives, they can come into the library and sort of take a breath because there's people that are going to make them comfortable and see to their needs. Um, the library really is, and, and some said this was our most important role, it, they're the communication and the information hub for the community. We have the well-equipped well tech labs. Uh, we're offering internet, free Wi-Fi, the email, fax, photocopiers, and we have landlines. We served as temporary headquarters for FEMA, for other government agencies, for relief workers, and even the military. And we also serve as distribution uh, centers for re relief agencies and a gathering place for information updates. Libraries have always provided these services, but in an emergency, we truly become ports in a storm. And embracing this role, and this was one thing that we were encouraging our libraries that attended the conference, you know, by embracing this role is a way that libraries, your library, can continue to evolve, to meet the needs of the community, and to be valued as essential services. In fact, one, there is a Stafford Act uh, from the FEMA that does designate libraries as essential services that was recently amended, and in uh, being classified as an essential service, that means that we are eligible for funds immediately from FEMA to set up our services in another location. So uh, that uh, we had just in the, in the last year or so, I think, that has been changed and we're very happy. Uh, we lobbied for that and we're very happy to do that. So what did we do or what, what did uh, the State Library do? We tried to listen to what uh, libraries at Ocean County who really stepped up to the plate and there were many others like Neptune and many others around the state and we tried to come up with the things, a template uh, to strategize what would we tell other libraries or the things that you needed to know, what did you need to do in order to step into the role as an unofficial community disaster recovery center. And you've already said and we say this all the time in emergency planning, it's a matter of when 
you know, not if it's going to happen, it's a matter of when it's going to happen. So, what did we say? The first thing you have to do is you have to prepare your library facility and staff. You have to have a disaster plan, an emergency tech plan, a service continuity plan, and a temporary facilities plan. Don't, don't panic. Okay, that's a lot of planning. And we know that uh, uh, based on the Heritage Health Index back in 2005, 70% of the libraries have no disaster plan whatsoever, and they don't have staff to carry it out. You can start doing these things one at a time, little by little. Um, it's a big job, but you've got to start somewhere, start chipping away. But these are the things that you're going to need in place in order to uh, serve in this role. So, you know, bringing your power supplies now. Talk about, uh, do we want to get a generator in it? We had an interesting conversation where Susan was telling us a generator costs $125,000, and that doesn't even do your whole building. You want to do your whole building, you're talking about $250,000 and up. So these, you know, these involve capital planning, you know, capital planning, saving funds, if you want to go that route. But you can certainly bring in power strips now, and you saw there was a great need for them. Um, one of the things I heard is, uh, you know, you want to have your tech lab. What if your building has sustained damages? Well, one of the things you don't want to stock up, stock up on are laptops and computers. Because, you know, it might be 10 years before something happens to your library. What's going to happen to that? What, what's that laptop going to be in 10 years? Is it even going to be useful to you? So what a lot of libraries do, or what, what's been recommended you do, is that a library save a few thousand dollars, two thousand, a thousand, whatever you can do, you save it in a fund. If an emergency hits, you go out right then and you buy your, your laptops, okay, rather than stocking up and having them not be useful anymore in a few years. Um, what was new, uh, I, as I mentioned in this conference, was uh, we focused on this conference not on writing a disaster plan. Okay, that's you know we've had workshops over the years at the state library where we went around the state and we taught disaster. We did workshops in disaster planning. This was focused inward on your facility, on your collections. What we really focused on this time was service continuity planning. That was adopted from the National Network a lot of Libraries of Medicine. It's adopted from the business model. It's how fast can you get your services, rather than your stuff, your collections, materials, how can you get your services up and running? And so we, that's what we focused on for this, is um, making, uh, taking the NNLM model and applying it to libraries. Make plans to keep your library website, uh, online resources, and social media as ex uh, accessible as you can. Uh, form a regional emergency response network. I'll we'll talk about that in a minute. Inform your elected officials about you know, your plans to serve as a disaster uh, response center. Develop a relationship with your community emergency responders. Work with other community partners that you can identify locally and help prepare your community for a disaster. And finally, be familiar with the salvaging family treasures materials. So one of the things we talked about was the one-page service continuity plan. Remember, we're taking the focus away from this just a disaster plan in this particular case, putting it on service continuity. This is the National Network Libraries and Medicine, NL, NNLM plan. It's called OPAL, one-page, um, one page all libraries. They have a pr program we're going to be pushing out that we learned about at the conference where um, uh, it's a 15 week program where you do these weekly exercises and you'll be able to uh, come up with your service continuity plan. It folds up just like that. If it's in your pocket, every library should have one. It's, it's much easier than doing a 100 page uh, 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 service continuity or disaster plan. And it is based on the Council of State Archivist prep plan. So you could also Google that and you could find out. Uh, there's been all sorts of like iterations of this. First there was the COSA prep plan, then libraries adapted, adapted it as a one-page disaster plan, and now NNLM has adapted it for service continuity and we gave those out at the, at the conference. I mentioned social media. Uh, social media plays a vital role in keeping people informed during the storm. And um, one of, uh, I think the best was Occupy Sandy. We were talking about that over dinner. So um, it's fairly well known. It did start out in New York because this was not only a, a New Jersey disaster. Uh, New York, Rockaways, Queens, Queens Public Library, and they really did yeoman's work. And their, their facilities were destroyed, a lot of their branches. 
And so out of this came Occupy Sandy. Uh, we found that social media is very adept at uh, covering disasters. And people, you know, use social media just like you use it, to connect, to share, to collaborate. So when Sandy hit New York and New Jersey, people did take to social media to you know, keep up with news reports. To, uh, they used mapping sites also to let people know where the open gas stations were so people weren't driving around like crazy. And when those changed, they updated everything. And then, of course, on Flickr, they posted hundreds of pictures of, of uh, storm damages. Um, emergency managers, emergency management, and libraries should plan on integrating social media into any of their disaster uh, plans because, you know, your public is really expecting it. Uh, people who lost access to TV or the radios, um, uh, the, if they had their smartphone and it was still charged, which was a big thing, um, they could still text. So the web is going to fall down and your SMS is going to stay up as long as you have battery charge. Your library website is a very important resource for the public. Uh, but in a time of crisis, you're going to need to push your messages out directly into the social media world. You want to go to where the audience is, and then you want to direct them back. And you, again, I'll use the Ocean County Library page as an example. Push the, push the information out through social media, directing them back to all the resources that you have online. So what happens? It happens after every disaster. People want to help. But you know they often donate things that were not requested, and that turned out to be more of a burden. So in, in those tragic Newtown, Connecticut shootings, uh, they, they had to actually ask people to stop sending donations. Um, there was a, I read an article um, about um, Juanita Rilling. She's the director of the Center for International Disaster Information in Washington, D.C. And this goes back to 1988 to a hurricane in Honduras where she told a story that there were so many unwanted donations that when the pl plane was trying to land on the tarmac bringing these need much needed medical supplies, the plane couldn't even land. They had to spend two days or 48 hours clearing out all of the donations that they couldn't use in order to get the medical supplies that they did really need. That's what the Red Cross calls a second tier disaster. You know, they end up with all this stuff that they have to clear out of the way just to get the stuff that they do need in. So, you know, by some estimates, 60% of donated items after disaster can't be used. And you know you don't want to discourage people um, from from helping, but you know get is there a better way to channel uh, these uh, good intentions? Um, and yes, a, a, a volunteer from Occupy Sandy actually came up with this. Um, I love it. Uh, they uh, it's actually using the Amazon uh, wedding registry, where towns and volunteer organizations. Um, registered, you know, you registered your town, and this is a role for what that libraries can do in their own communities. You register your town, and then you can tailor it to exactly what your town needs. So I think this one is asking for hand warmers. Do you need cleaning supplies, dehumidifiers, <coughs> pots and pans? You know, whatever it is that your particular community needs, this worked out very well. In fact, it worked out so well that Occupy Sandy also extended it to the business community. You're going to need help when you're dealing with a larger emergency, so join a regional emergency response network. They're going to help you, um, you know, prepare and cope with disasters. Uh, joining a mutual aid network um, also helps you with joint disaster planning, response and recovery, and it helps you uh, acquire supplies and equipment. We have two already in New Jersey on the top. Uh, there's the Atlanta County Library. They formed uh, a mutual aid work network in South Jersey that not only included libraries, but it includes um, other cultural organizations, and that's basically for help um, in salvaging any materials that were damaged. Uh, and you can see that we had practice drills down there at the Atlanta County Library. We actually did a mock disaster with the materials and then practice setting everything up and drawing it out. And then down the bottom is the Barone County Library system. Uh, they formed, uh, we had a grant at the State Library, we awarded $10,000. Uh, to Burlington County because uh, the, the county library, all of their branches and uh, other libraries are not in the system in Burlington County, like Willingboro, um, and Morristown Library, and Mount Laurel Library, 
they joined and they formed a regional response network. They uh, all wrote their own disaster plans and submitted to the state library. They got a, you know, a cache of $10,000 worth of um, emergency supplies for a large scale, scale disaster. What I liked about that, that plan, you see the supplies um, that are being unloaded, is that they actually, on the county library's headquarters, they had, oh, I keep calling it boost, it's not boost, it's that one. The tractor trailer, there's a cab up front, and the what's in the back? It's not the boots, the, the uh, cabin, or whatever it is. They actually had that parked on their facility, loaded all the disaster supplies into that container so that all they had to do is sort of back up a cab in the event of emergency, and they could drive that truck uh, to whatever library was having that emergency. And then I also want to mention uh, the Alliance for Response, that's a national program. Uh, for uh, cultural uh, heritage and disaster management, and that is, works on bringing together um, libraries and cultural community with emergency responders in a series of forums so that they can talk about how to form new partnerships, write new policies, and a cooperative uh, joint plan, planned uh, joint efforts together. So, you heard about Neptune, you heard about Ocean County. Sandy was a lesson for city and state officials who often forget the many roles that libraries play throughout an emergency. Make elected officials aware of the library's capabilities so they're going to actually direct people to your library. Uh, we heard about ways to do that. You can prepare materials, you can attend their meetings, and you need to remind them every year of what the capabilities are as, as a library. And during a disaster, remember to stay in touch with them, keep the communication going both ways. Uh, working with your emergency responders. I mean, they've always been prepared, uh, involved with emergency preparedness. That's their job. It's only recently that libraries have begun really to think about working more closely with their uh, local offices of emergency management. So getting them sometimes to recognize the benefit of partnering with libraries you know, can be a little bit tough. But I think after Sandy, especially in the regions where, you know, uh, where Sandy hit the hardest, I think they now have a new perspective on libraries and are, are, are more willing to form successful partnerships. So uh, again, you need to let them know ahead of time before the disaster strikes. Yes, they'll step in at the last minute, but you know they really need to be fully prepared on what you can do. So in order for a partnership with your emergency management uh, to be successful, we must also learn to speak the language, the language of emergency response. And when a disaster hits, emergency management immediately employs the incident command system. It started in the 1970s with the California wild flock uh, fires when you know they had plenty of you know firefighters there but for some reason you know there was a lack of communication a lack of accountability and an unclear chain of command that let that chain of command is one of the terms that they use um, that led to a lot of confusion uh, employing ICS it's a standard on scene sort of a supercharged management system that allows for the integration of facilities and equipment and personnel procedures and communications um, it ensures that there's going to be a coordinated uh, response among all emergency personnel. Um, it's flexible, it's scalable, it's, you know, as if, if, if the disaster, or they call them disaster incidents, if the incident mushrooms over a large area, so does the incident command system. And then it's able to shrink back down as the incident is contained. So in the cultural community, there's really been a, a conscious effort over the last few years to learn the language of emergency response, to better integrate with emergency response. And right here you have their website, you can take their training, uh, at the very least, just read through it to become familiar with the terminology, or you can work all the way through and uh, become certified. The next thing you want to uh, do is look for um, uh, your community emergency response teams and consider getting this training yourself. The Red Cross is looking for more volunteers, and after Sandy, they had called in the thousands of people wanting to help. The problem was people were not trained, and they can't put people in place despite all their good intentions, if they're not trained. So we encourage libraries to get CERT training. It educates people about potentials right in their own community, okay? Because we say all disaster is all disasters, all disaster planning and response is local. Um, so it will train you in such things as um, 
response drills as fire safety, light search and rescue team organization on disaster medical uh, operations. So if you don't have a CERT in your own community, you can check the New Jersey um, Office of Emergency Management webpage. You can check the FEMA webpage, you'll find a, one in your region, and if not, you can start your own um, CERT, uh, CERT team right in your, in your library. Now, there was even a team CERT, the zombie apocalypse which was a smash success when the, the CDC debuted it in 2011. There's still the resources up there. Libraries are always looking for programming uh, uh, in their, in, uh, to help educate their community. This is one that you could offer to teenagers. It's going to give them some skills that will last a lifetime. Um, it was very popular. As I said, all the resources are still there. Uh, when it debuted in 2011, their blog got 60,000 views per hour and zombie apocalypse was the third uh google's third most popular search term so i don't know if that came out with that show the walking dead in 2011 but it was very very successful in fact the cdc even had to come out and issue a statement to the huffington post that zombies do not exist and the cdc does not know of any virus or con condition that would reanimate the dead <laughs> Now you have to go out and you have to find other partners in your community whose mission includes disaster response. That's the Citizen Corps. Somebody mentioned the United Methodist Church. I, I, before we did this conference, I just was not aware of the, the yeoman's work that these church and religious organizations do. I mean, th these are the people that, you know, where, where, where evacuees can shelter in their facilities. And uh, they really do an amazing job. These are the people that roll up their sleeves, that really get dirty, that are going to pull out your drywall and pull out the, the wet carpeting. And um, so what you want to do is you find out who they are in your community and offer to partner with them, get to know them, join them, be prepared to work with them when the next disaster strikes. So you're prepared. Your library is prepared. Your staff is prepared. You've alerted your municipal officials and your emergency responders about, you've told them about all your resources. You've identified community partners. Now it's time to get your community ready. And we have ready.gov, which was launched by FEMA in 2003. It's a national service advertising campaign. It's also in Spanish. And uh, the whole purpose is to educate Americans to prepare and to respond for emergencies. It offers some really fantastic publications on helping families, uh, children, the elderly, uh, the disabled prepare for an emergency. If you go to their website, I think they'll send you about 300 brochures each. So these are things that you can actually pass out to your community. Uh, they also uh, emergency uh, for pets because one thing everybody learned is that people are not going to leave their pets. They're not going to go into a shelter if they have to leave their pets behind. And then you can take part in um, National Preparedness Month, which is in September. That is a great month to put on all sorts of programming in, in the public library. Uh, you can focus on emergency preparedness. Uh, you'll find at this site, you'll find all sorts of uh, ideas for, uh, that, that will showcase and actually promote the role of the library as a disaster recovery center. Um, one good program is a community day where you can sort of give out the ready.gov um, brochures, but you can also train people what they're going to need in their personal go packs. These are the, this is the stuff that you can't live without, and you want to have it pre-packed in a backpack and ready to go out the door with. And NNLN actually pioneered this program or piloted the program, and they actually had funding uh, to give go packs out to the, uh, to the community. So I think that's a, a real terrific idea, and I think libraries can actually sponsor that kind of community day. Now, you're gonna, you have to be aware that uh, people are going to come to you or come to the public library with all of um, sorts of damaged family treasures, you know, photographs, Bibles, Bible records. And before Sandy hit, Heritage Preservation knew that this was really going to be an issue. You know, once people knew that they were okay, that their families were okay, they were going to turn and look around at all that they had lost and all that was most precious to them and their belongings. And, and so what they did was they sent, uh, they sent out uh, the articles on caring for family treasures to over 400 news uh, agencies prior to the storm. 
here in New Jersey and New York, and not one of them picked it up and ran and ran with it. It was only afterwards that the press started picking up the stories about, you know, what everyone has lost and how devastated people were about the loss. So you have to remember that you're not conservators and be careful in what kind of advice you dispense because sometimes it can make things worse instead of better. But we talk library, libraries about some of the tools that they could use um, and resort to when people came up to them with the, you know, the, wet, the, wet, the wet birth certificates. And what you see in the upper, uh, my upper right is uh, the Heritage Preservation Emergency Field Guide and Salvage Wheel, which you just sort of spin around and say, okay, let photographs, this is what it says you should do. Um, you'll, uh, I have this on my iPhone. It's the Emergency Response app, again, by Heritage Preservation, and it's basically that emergency response wheel for your phone. It's fantastic. You hold up your phone. You're not scrolling through all these different pages. It's everything sort of on one, on one page when you click on it. And then, of course, print materials, paper materials. Can't emphasize that enough. That was very, very important. So, in the end, you know, to serve uh, your community as a disaster recovery center, you have to be creative and responsive to the needs of your community because, you know, all disasters are local and um, you have to prepare. And some of the ideas people threw out were preparing local services to move to shelters, schools, and churches, setting up small libraries, books, and magazines in other locations. Go to where the help is needed. Go to where the people are. Run special tour story times for children. This frees up the parents to use the computers while they while you help them fill out FEMA forms. Let the rec department use your community room for it to run arts and crafts. Uh, offer internet and email, not just to the general public, but to the Red Cross, the National Guard, uh, to other volunteer organizations who are in the area to help. Allow mental health agencies to hold meetings in your library so they can help people cope with their emotions. Project news and uh, local emergency updates on a wall all day long, all night long, so people passing by or people who are in the, in the library can constantly get updates. Let community groups run code drives and uh, food drives in your library. Be a distribution point for other, other agencies. Uh, Susan said it, say yes. Say yes to anything that you can do to help your community and to help build social capital for the library. You know, public libraries, this is, you know, they're in the communities. This is their communities. This is your community. You can make a difference right in your neighborhood. You can serve as a port and storm. especially, you know, hearing the stories of people firsthand and, and what, you know, could libraries do to help people in that situation? Do I kind of raise that? 
and and to help your own people and to help our own people. Because the secondary yes. trauma. And, yes, exactly. One of the actually one of the first things that we did is we um, we, we negotiated with our employee assistance program to open it up to all staff members. So and encouraging them to go. And I would say, look, this is a benefit. It's confidential. Make sure that you use it. We also have just with, with you work reference in the public library. You're also familiar with sometimes you need to take a break because you may be suffering a loss, and the people are telling you a loss. It's, it's being sensitive to what your colleagues are going through. Because maybe maybe you say, you know, Pat, why don't you take this reference question for me? You know, I'm about to go break to do that. But it's making sure there's uh, that is available and that's for all staff and that they take advantage of it. And likewise, we brought in uh, similar programs for our staff that we had you know, trainings also on how to deal with the issue. Also, same similar programs for the public on coping with, uh, coping with the disaster by partnering with community mental health organizations or county mental health organizations. Because, as you know from your background as a social worker, as librarians, we are not social workers, and it's interesting because in a public library, I think that's almost one of the best backgrounds you can almost have or careers you can have sometimes is that expertise. So we would bring social workers in to meet with the public or to meet with our staff for those trained professionals. And, and that's one of, it was really one of the first things we did. We would say, you know what's going to hit you? It might hit you now, it might hit you later. So, but that is one of the things we did earlier. That mm -hmm. Any other questions? We have some online question. Yes. Um, Karen Levine wants to know how would family members recommend getting started with creating disaster? Are there available models or resources that you can have? The question is um, how would the panel recommend? Um, resources to start your own disaster plan, exactly. those kinds of things. I think yes. that Michelle was uh, yeah, sure. put some of that. She could give us that. that. You know, when when you first go online and you start looking around for you know, putting the keywords in disaster planning, you're going to end up with so many, so much information. It's overwhelming. Uh, what do I pick? What's right? What's a good, you know, what's a good plan? What's a good template? I mean, literally, there's going to be pages and pages of that. So, um, so take take a look. You can start on the New Jersey State Library's website. I did put a page up on disaster planning and response. I do link to um, disaster templates. There are some really well known out there. If you want a straightforward disaster plan, again, I spoke in the beginning. I said look, this is focusing internal for focusing on your facilities, on your uh, collections. Probably the most famous is by the Northeast Document Conservation Center. It's called Plan. All right, that's free. It was IMLS uh, funded. It's online. Uh, so just if you do the D plan, you'll come up with it. You know, the thing about D plan, it is a template, but it's 100 pages long. And so if you are a small facility, you can be a little bit intimidated by it, even though it's kind of fill in the blank. Um, NADCC responded to that, to that. They came up with D plan light for small institutions. But uh, I also have links for that COSA, Council State Archives prep plan, and that was modified from archives to libraries, and so you'll find that. And uh, I think Web Junction also has a lot of uh, templates, as does the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. So really, there's no shortage of templates out there. Um, find the right one for you. There's no right way. There's no right way to do it. Social media comes up to be an important resource in storing a disaster. 
But the question is, it almost seems like an oxymoron. You use social media, but you don't have electricity. So how do you do that? So do you have any comments on that? Or? Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. You do need a redundant, but what we noticed was so many people have smartphones now, which do have access to the web. So if you can have that, you have to have redundant systems. Sometimes it was people outside of our community. Um, if we had some staff that were displaced that had access to power, and if you do have access to power, but if you don't have any access to power, it is old school, it's the radio. <laughs> it is the radio. I remember, and our radio stations did a wonderful job, and many of our residents would come and say, I'm so upset, I need the newspaper, and I need the radio. Um, I remember going to the shelters, and they, and they said, we need the newspaper. So we, Make sure that they have gotten some, some newspapers. So it's a mix because you'll have people outside knowing more than you know. They're all connected with social media. I've had friends in different states and family saying, knowing more about what was going on because they could see the news or see it online than I knew because I had no power. Um, I would say, get a <laughs> get a charger for your car because I, I had couples phone phones and I had my work cell phone and when the power died I was conservatively running my car engine a little bit to charge my phone just enough so I could get text. For some reason texts went through for me. So and you have to rely on your team members. So it's really multiple redundant systems. Um, Prior to becoming a librarian, I worked in New York City, so there was also 9-11. That was one of the similar things they found in 9-11 was, was communication. So you need multiple ways to communicate, um, and there's not one method. For, for example, for FEMA, which we were talking about, one of the things we said is, yes, we're making it online on our website, but we also had paper-based stations in our branches, so people could access the information in the paper. So paper works. For there's no power. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, you know, I can't because I, because really, ebooks are great, and those reading devices are great, but when the batteries die, the print book is a wonderful thing. The reference collection is good, so multiple, multiple uh, modalities. I got the second half of season, I mean, if there's a um, you know, your, your cell phone's going to last, you know, 24 hours or so. So there were picture, people taking pictures until their cell phones died. And I can't tell you how many people had ch car chargers or doing just that, sitting in my car. People have multiple devices, all right? People were on their iPads till it died or whatever kind of uh, tablet they had. Then they were on their cell phone. So, and then it kind of bounced all around. It had, so, some of the people in the storm areas got back power more than I did, and I wasn't even touched by the storm other than my electricity going out. So, and, and we have installed our branches. Now, we were in the process of installing it. We have the, the, the hot slots, plain old telephone systems, just plain old landlines, because they, you know, they will work um, in a situation. Sometimes, you know, like you said, we don't have a whole lot of so. Plain old telephone. I think we have one more time for one more question. I'll take an online question. An online question. Online question. Yeah, Lee wanted to know. She says that the um, NJLA disaster preparedness recovery March 10, 2012 PDF was very detailed. And she wants to know whether NJLA has updated a the library community with this information that you shared. Um, is there a plan to add that information to the disaster preparedness? To the site to add the information to the question about what are our future plans in terms of, shall we say, disaster preparedness. Uh, I think one of the things we can say is Michelle and I, certainly the, the statewide organizations, NJLA and the New Jersey State Library, are very committed to making sure that this is a long term uh, goal of ours to keep um, updating these plans and to um, Michelle's uh, conference, it was a great beginning, but there's so much more that we have to do, and those things will be updated, we assure you, and that we'll be doing more trainings, because this is not, as, as we said, it's going to be when the next incident is, and we've all learned that lesson, unfortunately. 
very hard lesson this time. So definitely there will be much, much more training. And I guess that also brings us to the role of the library school, that that should be sort of built into some of your courses now, that as you go out into the future, this is not an independent thing. This is part of what you should be learning as you go forward. It's a, going to be a basic part of whatever type of library you're working in disasters or natural or physical or whatever kind of, you are going to have to be trained to deal with emergencies. That is part of being it your technology, being it your own communities. So I think we would encourage it also to be part of library school training or whatever you take. Um, I volunteer at the Long Branch uh, local history room and every week I drive by the Ocean Port Branch. Uh, so how can we find out if <coughs> what the plans are to get that branch back online, there's a way to help out when it's time to move back in there. I, I, I guess I thought that was part of Mom County system, not Ocean, but it, it was brought up with the photographs, so. She asked about a specific library that is still closed and it's Ocean, Ocean Port, Port, and that library is part of the Mom County library system, so I think you have to find out from the director. Uh, I, it is my understanding that all the, direct, all the branches that we know of are to be reopened, particularly about the main libraries, but we do have ones like uh, Seabright and Monmouth Beach are very, very small towns, and they do not have as much support locally, so they're going to have to do that, but I'm almost positive Oceanport will be rebuilt because it is part of the Monmouth County Library System. I just heard that. Ah, there, we, we had a workshop today at Monmouth County, and I was speaking with the director. I know, I was there. Oh, oh yeah, that's right, you were there. So what he said, so he, it's going to be open in a month, about a month. And you know, the, wow. and, and what happened there, when he said that the lesson they learned was, the problem was not all the ocean water coming in, it was then all the sewage water coming up. And so even though books in the first, you know, couple of feet would have been damaged, from the sewage water, actually, then they had to move everything right up to the, you know, you can't just leave that and say, oh, I'm going to save everything else. Everything had to go, but in a better market. It's yeah. interesting that you bring that up, though, because we talked about all these libraries at the shore, but we also had the Jersey City Public Library, which is an urban center, got the same kind of water oh, damage in the basement, and over a million dollars of damage was in the oh. Jersey City because the water came up through the basement. So again, we've learned many different things, many different uh, lessons on all types of libraries at this forum. So we want to thank you. Um, yes, we do. Thank you for thank you. participating. And uh, I think there's a present for the library. Yes, actually. Well, first of all, let's give our panelists and our moderator a <laughs> really inspiration to hear about your hard work and your dedication. And I hope everybody is inspired about what libraries can do in their community. And now I'd like to uh, bring Lissa back, Kristen, uh, who is the Lisa. president of Lissa. She, well, she's Miss Lissa today. And uh, if you notice, we had a bake sale going on all day, and they actually raised some money. So, Pat, if you would come in front of the table so that uh, Kristen can formally present you. Formally present you. We raised $155. And special thanks to Sue, who also really contributed a lot uh, to that uh, to that number. So, thanks very, very much. Thank you. Pictures? Yeah, okay. Very good. So, while they're doing that, I'd just like to again thank everybody for coming out tonight. Thanks to our online students. Uh, this is our last lecture. You guys are now done with colloquium, except, of course, for your reflections. And, of course, the discussion forum is open, so go forth and reflect. And uh, again, thank you for uh, all your time and attention.